Thank you, and thank you for the invitation to come and talk to Upholland uh, U3A photographic group. So this is my take on wildlife photography. Most of what you're going to see are pictures that I've taken over the last mm, 10 or 20 years, I guess. Um, a lot of them from East Africa when I've been on wildlife safaris. So this is not really a talk, it's really an excuse for me to show my holiday photos. Along the way, I'll try and indicate a few sort of general hints and tips and do's and don'ts. For those that like the technicalities, occasionally when it's relevant, I'll mention shutter speeds and apertures, etc. Um, and the intention is to possibly help some of you get more out of your own attempts to capture wildlife. And it doesn't really matter whether that means wildlife in Africa or wildlife in your back garden. So I'm going to be covering composition, focus, lighting, shutter speed and lens aperture, some context, and a little bit of serendipity. Because no matter what you plan, sometimes a great photo is the result of good luck rather than the expertise of the photographer. So I'll be breaking it down into these very rough and ready sections, rather than just randomly throw animals at you or birds at you or putting them in some silly alphabetical order or something like that. So we'll start by thinking about uh, composition, framing the subject. So how big a telephoto lens do you need? If you're going to go on safari and the animals are a long way away, how big a telephoto do you need in order to make sure that you can capture either the lion that you want to capture or the cheetah running or the bird in a tree uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 meters away? No, you don't need a lens like that, though some people I know have actually bought this beast. Yeah, look at the biceps on that chap, eh? Um, and some, some people who uh, specialize in bird photography definitely go for the longer lenses. Um, having spent quite a few years trying to capture animals and, to some extent, birds, I have found that my lens of choice, which is a compromise between a long enough focal length to capture action at a distance, as well as keeping it small enough and light enough, I found the best compromise to be that particular beastie. I'm a Nikon man myself, and when I found this Nikon 300 millimeter that fits in the palm of your hand, F4 lens, I thought, that's the lens for me. So many of the images I'm going to show you, not all, but many of the more recent images, were taken with that particular lens. So is 300 millimeters enough? Don't you need 1,000 millimeters or more uh, in order to get uh, the action? Well, here's a, a wonderful male lion um, just looking into the breeze, having the mane wafted by the breeze. And it, to get an idea of just how close you can get to these animals in East Africa, most of the time I'm talking about Kenya and Tanzania rather than any other countries, that gives you an idea from some of, um, somebody taking a picture of my left ear and the lion. And you can see that in many cases, as long as you don't disturb the animals, you can get reasonably close, especially to the predators. Getting close to the gazelles, who are a little more skittish, can be a problem. But getting close to the big cats, generally speaking, you can quite happily get to within 10 or 20 meters of them. So you don't need a fantastically long lens. So this is the, the photo I took for the splash screen that you, shaw, you saw just a few seconds ago. This is a lioness. She's actually protecting cubs who are down in the long grass here where you can't see them. The lioness parked herself on that bough made it absolutely clear that she was in charge, and just for a split second, she looked over her shoulder, not looking directly at us, but just to say, I'm in charge here, you stay where you are, that's fine. So I only had a second to grab this particular photo. And afterwards, I realized, well, the framing wasn't really optimal, and I thought later, maybe a framing would have been better if I'd cropped it down to something like that. In other words, putting things off center usually looks better, but in the split second you've got to take the photo, you don't always think of that. Generally speaking, shoot first, ask questions later is sometimes the philosophy if you've only got a fraction of a second to catch the frame you want. So this particular picture I ended up cropping slightly differently, and that's the luxury of digital photography. If you capture an image and as long as it's sharp and in focus, etc., you can always crop it down and still produce a, a nice image at the end of the day. In terms of framing, this particular picture, this lion actually had a, a broken paw, which is why he's looking a, a little bit uh, off there. But that wasn't the original picture. The original picture included the reflection in the, uh, in the river. 
And when you look at the reflection, you suddenly notice there's actually another line in there. So again, the framing matters, because the original frame, I actually got the lioness twice. But you could argue, with a picture like that, having got home and having looked at it, you might say to yourself, well, actually, that's a nice picture, but actually, is the framing actually better to ignore the lioness at the top and keep her as a sort of a, a little... Uh, a little cameo, if you like, being seen through the legs of the male lion only in reflection. And again, with the benefit of hindsight, you could say, well, I could have framed it differently in the first place. But what about focus? I mean, I'm probably teaching you all to suck eggs, but it is rather important to make sure that uh, things are reasonably sharp, especially if you want to take your image and crop it down, perhaps, after the event. It's important that the original subject is in focus. And depending on the camera that you have, I'm not sure if you have compact cameras or bridge cameras or DSLR cameras or mirrorless cameras, but some people I know are not fully conversant with how their camera works. In this particular shot, I actually focused on the whiskers of the lioness before snapping off the picture just to make sure it was as crisp as it could be. And of course, that means the background is out of focus. But some cameras try to be very clever. Depending on how you've got your camera set up, they might take focus points from a lot of different places in the image. And your camera might decide that this is the highest contrast part of the image, and that's presumably the subject, the bow of the tree, and the line just happens to get in the way. Remember, no matter how intelligent your camera tells you it is, it is not intelligent. It's trying to work out what it is you want. Some cameras will take focus from different parts of the image and will assume that the closest thing is obviously the object that you wanted to photograph and everything else is in the background. So if your camera happens to be set in that mode, your camera might have decided that this tree in the foreground is the subject and everything else is just clutter in the background. So do make sure you know how the autofocus on your camera works to make sure you don't get fooled at any point. In this particular case, for instance, um, trying to photograph a bird in a tree, there's clearly lots of foliage at the same distance of the bird and behind the bird and in front of the bird. And focus, autofocus cameras can get very confused as to what am I expected to focus on? Is it all of this green stuff or is it the orange thing in the middle? Some will assume that the object in the middle is important, but as we've seen earlier, sometimes you deliberately put your subject off-center so you have to be careful to make sure you don't end up with a picture of a perfectly focused branch and an out-of-focus bird. I've got a few of those which I'm not going to show you because it occasionally does happen. If the, if the subject is far enough away, like all of these cormorants in the tree, they are all effectively at the same distance and so the camera has no problem focusing in, in a situation like that. And in this particular case, the small bird happened to be at essentially the same distance as all the other leaves around it. And so again, the camera had no problem ensuring that everything was in focus because there was very little between us and the bird. And therefore, the camera had no problem focusing and figuring out what it should be focusing on. When it comes to getting close to mammals, well, you can certainly get close to lions, sometimes a little bit too close. And when it gets to the point where you are so close it actually matters, sometimes you can't even get both eyes in focus at the same time because the animal is so close to you. It might literally be only a few meters away. In this particular case, the lioness was about the same distance as the front row is from me at the moment, literally just a few meters. If you have a choice, focus on the eye that is closest to you because that is how humans tend to work. If a human is looking at another face and you have a choice of which eye to look at, a human will normally look at the closest eye. So if you have a choice and if it matters, if your depth of field is not enough to make sure everything is sharp, make sure the closest eye of the two is in focus. I don't always follow that rule because quite often I find it's easier to focus on the whiskers of animals simply because the whiskers are nice high contrast white, usually on a darkish background. But there are times when you find focus difficult. This particular leopard was coming towards us in the early morning. The sun was very low, and we had a very good driver guide who said, don't worry about trying to catch that leopard as it is. It's quite a, quite a fair distance away. It might have been the best part of 100 meters away when we first saw it. 
rather than our driver guide saying, let's drive closer to the leopard, he said, let's not drive towards the leopard, let's drive away from the leopard, just over there, because I know that that leopard is walking towards the watering hole. So if we go over there and wait another two or three minutes, the leopard will walk right in front of us, because leopards don't care about tourists, they don't see them as a threat. So we thought, well, it's a shame not to get that beautiful picture like that, but let's do what he says, let's drive in the opposite direction and wait a few minutes. And absolutely, we were indeed rewarded by the fact that the leopard then walked effectively right past us. The only difficulty there was changing focus fast enough to actually keep it in focus as it walked only two or three meters away from the safari van. But again, not always having the luxury of focusing on the eyes, I tended to focus on the whiskers to try and keep everything as crisp as possible. You perhaps don't always think about these things, and I certainly didn't at the time, but when I was intending to photograph this cormorant and its reflection, I forgot about the fact that if you focus on the bird, the reflection is slightly further away, because we're looking down on the bird, and so the reflection of the bird is actually just a little bit further away. So if you focus on the bird, the reflection is slightly out of focus. Doesn't matter too much until, unless you're very critical about blowing this up. You may not notice it on these images, because of course you're seeing the image, you're seeing something of order, a megapixel or so, of the image. The original image might be 10 or 20 or more megapixel, but for the purposes of a PowerPoint presentation, these things uh, with a finite resolution of the projector, you're seeing perhaps only a megapixel or two. So you might not notice the fact that the, uh, the head of the reflection of the bird is slightly out of focus, but it's something that I completely forgot at the time, and I just focused on the head, and luckily, the reflection wasn't too far out of focus to cause me too much of a problem. But I do like the fact that its tail just dips in the water and then produces these ripples uh, around the point at which the tail contacts the water. Uh, this is one where I admit I didn't get focus right, mainly because I had a fraction of a second and was too slow. It's very difficult to work out what's going on here because you've got blue up here and you've got blue down there and you're trying to work out, well, what is water and what is sky? And the answer is they're both water. So that's water, that's water with a little spit of land and that's another piece of water with the reflection of a bird in the distance and the sky is way up there. And in this particular case, neither the mother nor the daughter wanted to get their feet wet so instead of walking over muddy ground, they just did a little bit of a leap. And I wasn't quite ready for that. So when they leapt, I wasn't actually focused on the impala. I was still focusing on the grass down here. And the autofocus didn't snap fast enough compared to my pushing the trigger and uh, firing off the shot in a fraction of a second. The autofocus was a, a fraction of a second behind it. So that would be a really nice shot if it was in focus. As it is, it's a sort of nice shot, but... Um, not quite what I was uh, hoping for at the time. Okay, let's assume that we can from now on keep the subject in focus. What about using lighting to best effect? We are of course talking about wildlife photography, so although in principle uh, you can use flash photography for birds if they're in a, a very darkened area in the middle of a bush where you can hardly see them, sometimes flash works well, but I don't use flash for any of the images I've been talking about. So lighting is sometimes under your control and sometimes not. Usually the only control you have with lighting is what time of day you choose to go out and photograph animals. Sunset, sunrise, when the light is uh, nice and low and you get long shadows, fantastic. If you're out in the middle of the day, there's not much you can do about it. So you can get some nice portraits, in this case a water buck that was very conveniently staring at it because it was curious as to what we were up to. But with the light coming from above, it's not as nice as having light coming from the sides where you can actually start to play with the light and start to pick up extra features of the, of the wildlife. So again, you can tell this was taken in the middle of the day because look at the shadow of the young zebra. The shadow is almost immediately below it. The sun is almost directly overhead. Kenya is on the equator. So depending on what time of year you go, the sun, the midday sun, is nearly always overhead. The sun rises at the same time, the sun sets at the same time, midday the sun is overhead. So if you're out at midday, there's not much you can do, you get very little in the way of shadows. But if you choose the timing right, 
when you get the sun a little lower in the sky, in this case, for this particular uh, Thomson's gazelle, the light was coming from behind. In this case, I think it's from behind and to our right. So you get a little bit of delineation of the, of the animal. You see a little bit of white around the outside, and it shows up a little better, uh, reflections off the horns, etc. shows up if you can get yourself into a position where the sun is coming in from one side or the other. And again, if the sun is behind the animal, then a rather boring beast like the wildebeest, if it'll excuse me calling it boring, suddenly looks very interesting when the sun starts to catch the beard of the wildebeest as it's grazing there with the sun behind it. And again, in the middle of the day, it's difficult to, to, um, to get the lighting right, so here we have zebras, uh, I think this is mother and foal, and again the lighting is coming from above, Okay, it's a nice portrait of a zebra, but it's quite boring as far as the lighting is concerned. Whereas if you choose the right time of day, this was sunrise, you get a much nicer result. And this is one of my favorite animal pictures of, uh, of all in, in Kenya. Although it's great to take pictures of lions and cheetahs and elephant, etc., the, the lowly zebra, in my opinion, still produce some wonderful images. So I like this one for a number of reasons. It's a nice family portrait. It's zebras doing what zebras do. They feed most of the day, and usually one of them is on lookout just in case there's a lion in the neighborhood. So having a family portrait of zebras just grazing with the light over in the top left, the light is just catching the seed heads of the grass here, and so you get this rather tranquil vision of zebras just getting on with the daily life of eating and trying to avoid being eaten. And that is so much nicer than simply having the sun directly from above. And again, if you're going to take pictures at sunset, all animals will kick up some dust at some point. And so if you can get yourself in the right position with some of the light coming from behind them, then you can start to get some rather atmospheric shots of animals walking through the dust. In this particular case, uh, zebras with... Uh, some wildebeest in the background, not deciding to join in with the march, but have already hunkered down for the night by the looks of it. First thing in the morning, uh, we were actually, friends and I were leaving a lodge, and we looked back just as we were leaving the lodge, and we realized that some eland, some of the largest uh, antelope in, in Kenya, were just coming down to the, uh, to the watering hole to drink, and so we realized that they were just being caught at the right time with the just rising sun hitting them and reflections in the water. So we told our driver to stop, we got our stuff out, we unpacked our cameras and everything else that we had packed away for the next trip, and, uh, and we uh, snapped a few pictures um, briefly before moving on to the next lodge and the next uh, national park. But that in a sense, could be classified under serendipity rather than under lighting because that was just luck that we happened to catch it just at the right time, just as they arrived at the water, catching the reflections. Uh, later in the day, that wouldn't have looked anything as nice without those golden colors. And every once in a while, again, you could call that serendipity, every once in a while, you just get the right sort of reflections. No, this zebra is not walking on water. It is just a very shallow, one centimeter deep uh, puddle, effectively. And I'm not sure what this zebra was thinking. I don't know what zebras think about all day, if they're not eating or watching out for lions. Maybe it's seen a lion in the distance, who knows? But I just get the impression that it's just contemplating existence, basically. And it's just standing there, again, a very sort of serene uh, view of, uh, of animals in Africa. So let's have a quick look at some of the technicalities of shutter speed and lens aperture. Depending on the camera you're using, you may not have either the choice or you may not have the time to make the choice of selecting a particular aperture and a particular shutter speed. I tend to leave my camera on a programmed mode such that I can easily override. I let it make the decision to give me the correct exposure, but just under my thumb, I have the option of kicking the shutter speed up or taking the shutter speed down or opening up the lens or shutting down the lens. And I can do that within a fraction of a second if I look at something and decide that's not quite what I want. <laughs> Sometimes you just don't have that luxury. You grab the image before you even think about shutter speed and aperture because the animal might move or change its pose, or if it's a bird, fly away. 
So sometimes I grab the image to make sure I've captured it and then think about should I have done that with a higher or lower shutter speed to try and get the optimum image. So in this particular selection, I will put shutter speeds and apertures down at the bottom there if anybody's interested. And don't have to remember these things because if anybody really does want to know, I've got handouts of the slides that you can refer to later if you so wish. So in this particular case, this butterfly was in a rather darkened part of a bush. It was very difficult to see what was going on. But you can see with its wings open, Again, focusing is not that much of a problem. So the lens, in this case, being um, close, if not at, wide open, very limited depth of field, as you can see from the fact that the twigs in the background are out of focus, having a limited depth of field wasn't too much of a problem and still had a 400th of a second, so there was no particular problem with uh, camera shake being handheld. But there are times when um, shutter speed and aperture are wrong. In this case, I had essentially no choice because in this case, um, heading back to the lodge at the end of a Safari game drive, the lighting was almost gone. It was already gone sunset. And two cheaters, two brothers, just happened to gamble up to the side of the, uh, the car, we were the, the Safari van that we were in. And they came hurtling up to us, ran alongside us, and then headed off into the bush. So I had essentially no time at all to decide what to do in terms of shutter speed or aperture. I literally just pointed and took a couple of frames. And even at a 40th of a second, you can see cheetahs are fast. Even when they're playing, cheetahs are fast, let alone when they're hungry and chasing a gazelle. So a 40th of a second did nothing to stop their movement. Uh, and it was virtually at uh, full open on the lens as well. And uh, as they ran off into the bush again, a 40th of a second. It does, of course, give this wonderful impression of speed, and it does give you the impression that cheetahs are indeed the fastest land mammal. I was intending to get a nice, sharp picture, but at the end of the day, I'm quite happy to have a blurred one. It's one of the few blurred images I've got that I think, yeah, that's actually quite a nice blurred image, yes. Given a choice, for instance, taking a picture of a, uh, in this particular case, a blue-eared starling. Um, starlings, of course, are iridescent. Even in this country, their fe feathers are iridescent, but in the East Africa, they take that to a new level. And as, if you catch them in the sunshine, the iridescence of the feathers can be spectacular. Called blue ear just because there's a patch of blue behind the eye there. And in this particular case, um, making sure that I stayed fairly wide open, on the aperture, it threw the background completely out of focus. It was out of focus anyway because there wasn't anything immediately behind the bird, in this case, um, sitting on this post. But by making sure I stayed with the lens wide open, it threw the background not just slightly out of focus, but completely out of focus. And therefore, it actually shows the sharpness of the bird and the bird's feathers in, in a nice relief. Similarly, for this goshawk, a similar sort of exposure now out in the sun in, towards the middle of the day. So now the, uh, the speed has gone up to something like 1 500th of a second, but still f5.6 rather than f8 or f11 or f16, which I could have chosen, um, to try and make sure this background stayed out of focus so that the bird's head stood out as clearly as possible. Yes, there's a, there's a lot of confusion down at the, the bottom here because, of course, all of this foliage is also in focus as well as the goshawk itself. But by keeping the head and shoulders of the bird out in the open, as it were, and keeping that background out of focus, that just makes it stand out from the crowd, as it were. That's the one we saw earlier of this lion deciding to pose for the cameras and point into the wind so that the wind was just ruffling its mane in a very magisterial way. Uh, and in this case, again, I didn't want these trees to be even close to being in focus, otherwise it would have confused it with the outline of the mane of the lion, so I just kept the aperture as wide as possible. In this particular case, this, these are white-fronted bee-eaters. This was actually from Tanzania rather than from Kenya. And again, I quite like this, with the exception that this joker on the right is out of focus because you notice that it's actually at f4. It's effectively, um, it wasn't a 300 mil lens in this case, but it was close to being wide open. And you can see I've got 1,000th of a second at f4. So I knew that because this, this twig that they're sitting on is going away from the camera, I knew that I would need a certain depth of field to get all four of them in focus at the same time. 
but I didn't stop down in order to get that depth of field because by stopping down it would have meant a longer exposure and I couldn't afford a longer exposure in this particular case because I was in a riverboat and being in a riverboat it was rocking from side to side and I needed a thousandth of a second to keep it close to being sharp so I sacrificed a little bit of depth of field knowing that it wouldn't all be in focus all the way across the image but I really did think I needed to keep a thousandth of a second because I just couldn't afford to go down to a 500th or a 250th or anything slower in order to take that um, aperture down to increase the depth of field. So in that sense, it's always a compromise. Whenever you have a non-optimal situation, you always have to compromise either depth of field or sharpness because of camera movement. Sometimes you get lucky and it's not a problem, but quite often you find that there's a compromise to be made. Whenever it's birds in flight, I have a little bit of a problem with that because it's a question of tracking. Uh, there are various focus modes in your camera that can try and keep things in focus. Once you've got something snapped to focus, even if its distance changes, the lens can continually automatically track and keep adjusting the focus. But trying to track a bird such that you're keeping it framed, you're trying to keep it such that you've got a nice frame for the, uh, for the final crop that you want, and also trying to make sure that you're not panning so fast the autofocus can't keep up with you, and also not panning a bird that's so close to you it seems to be sweeping across the sky so fast again that uh, you can't keep everything nice and sharp. So in this particular case vultures are very large animals and uh, I tried to use f8 to try and get the entire wingspan in focus even if the wings were pointing as it were towards me rather than broadside to me. And when this particular vulture uh, met up with another couple of vultures we could see that things were starting to get interesting when they started to have a scrap. Luckily, there were a couple of occasions on which all three vultures were at approximately the same distance. And so even with an aperture of f6.3, it was still possible to keep all of the three scrapping vultures in focus at the same time and still maintain something like a thousandth of a second to try and keep the, uh, the claws and the beaks sharp even though they were having quite a go at each other. That was quite a scrap in the end. I think at the end of the day these two are in focus and that one is slightly behind but in terms of the action portrayed it doesn't matter too much in terms of catching what was going on. Some birds of prey are quite helpful. They will just soar slowly in circles, sometimes predictably. If you position yourself next to a hill where there's a bit of uplift as the wind comes in and moves up the hill, you can sometimes get uh, an uplift, a thermal, uh, in which you can predict that at a certain time of the morning there'll be various buzzards, in this case an auger buzzard, coming in and probably circling overhead, perhaps only a few tens of meters above your head. And so at a particular time of day, I just stood in one place and tried to catch this auger buzzard as it came round. It wasn't moving particularly fast as it was just thermaling, so I didn't need to go to a thousandth of a second, so I could afford to stop down the lens a little bit, down to f9 in this case, uh, and that kept essentially all of the bird in focus, even though the wingtips are at different distances from me. And again, it, it was reasonably um, helpful in terms of not going away. It was only a few tens of meters away, and hence every once in a while it came round at the right sort of angle with the sun on its back to give a nice uh, view. In this case, the sun is actually shining through the, uh, the, the flight feathers of, of the bird. Context is always something that shouldn't be forgotten. It's nice to think about the bird I want to photograph or the animal I want to photograph. But I think it's always good to try and remind yourself that context sometimes is important. So, a nice picture of elephants, but in this particular case, it's almost lost the fact that you've got Kilimanjaro in the background. Because it's not a particularly crisp day, it's rather hazy on this particular day that uh, we were on a game drive. If it had been a rather nicer day, then th instead of the, uh, the land just dimming all the way to the back, you would have seen fields and trees all the way up here and then up to the slopes of Kilimanjaro. Yes, the top is often sticking up above cloud, but it's a bit of a shame that that wasn't quite as clear as I would have liked it. Um, I have been 
to Kirline Gyro on other days where it was a little bit clearer, but in this particular case, again, the skill of the driver guide, he says, look, there's a load of elephants walking over there. Don't bother photographing them. We're going to drive over there because in two minutes' time, they're going to walk in front of Kilimanjaro and you'll get your picture. So having a driver guide who knows the country and knows animal behavior is very valuable for getting the right shot. So this particular one, we literally parked up and then waited for these elements to walk into shot, effectively, with Kilimanjaro in the background. Not as clearly as I would have liked, but you can't have everything. And this shot I particularly like of the elephant coming out of the bush. Not cropped to just show a bull elephant, impressive though it is when you've got that many tons of bull elephant walking towards you, but in this case I deliberately wanted to get all of this background to remind people that the bush belongs to the elephant, not to us, we are just visitors there, and in this case the bull elephant walked out of the bush and you can see that it's just picking up dust with its trunk and throwing it around. It's basically just reiterating that it's the boss. And it walked, again, fairly close towards us to the point where even my wide-angle lens wasn't quite enough to get it all in shot. It was literally just a few meters away, and bull elephants are quite large animals. But this one I just particularly like because it just shows the context of elephants in their natural habitat rather than a tight crop of uh, a bull elephant with big ears. Giraffes, wonderful creatures, occasionally seen in ones and twos and family groups, but when I see a sudden group of 20 of them appear from nowhere, I thought I'd better snap that cropped to show the panorama from a, from a rather larger image. And it's interesting to see that the Giraffes were as curious to know what we were up to as vice versa. We happened to notice them, we stopped to photograph them. As soon as we stopped to photograph them, they all looked in our direction as if, what's that white van over there and what's, what are these guys actually doing? They didn't seem to be perturbed, they didn't seem to want to run away, but they were curious as to what we were doing. And occasionally we notice that with animals. Occasionally we notice a mother and calf where the mother... Uh, provide some stability. The calf might be curious as to what's going on, but the mother there just reminds it that there's no need to run because I'm not running, so there's no need to run with me, but clearly this is not a dangerous situation. So if you want to look at these peculiar people in their white vans, by all means do, it's not a problem. And I guess the calves then learn from the mothers how to uh, behave amongst tourists. Again, if they're close enough, you can get some nice images. In this particular case, it's a sort of nice image of a jackal. The head is just about focused and sharp, but notice that the exposure was long enough that the legs, uh, it was trotting past us. So the legs have blurred, but that doesn't give you anything in terms of how do jackals behave. All you know is that's what a jackal looks like if you can get close enough to one. But actually, you don't normally see jackals like that. You normally see jackals like that in the grass, sometimes only two ears sticking up above the grass. And depending on the time of year and depending on which country you're visiting, it might be that it's actually quite tricky to see some of the wildlife because if the grass is half a metre high or a metre high and animals are moving through that grass, you might find it difficult to work out where those animals are. And quite often we see animals like that just because they pop their head up and then we see them in the grass and then they pop their head back down again and maybe we don't see them again. Um, and they might still be there, but we can't see them. Grass can be long enough to hide surprisingly large animals. Um, in this particular case, um, we've argued... Yeah, we have argued as to whether this giraffe is standing up or lying down. Um, OK, it's probably sitting down. But giraffes don't sit down that often. They tend to uh, spend most of their time on their feet. But it's nice to think that that grass is long enough to actually hide a giraffe. Um, but perhaps not in this particular case. But again, most of the time, the grass is short. And I, I come back to this particular shot simply because it's one of my favorite shots. And it's a reminder that although the grass can grow to a meter high, by the time the wildebeest have gone through and had their fill, and by the time the zebras have had their fill, the grass ends up being perhaps only a few centimeters or so in height. 
and therefore, depending on the season, depending on exactly when the rains have come, depending on how long the grass is, that will dictate how easy it is to find large animals and small animals. And of course, the larger animals might be preying on the smaller animals, and so there's a whole food chain for you to think about. An African jacana, a beautiful bird sitting in a lily pad. And you might say to yourself, well, I can hardly make out the bird. And you could say, well, OK, forget that. Let's just blow the bird up. It's a beautiful bird. You can see the markings on it there. It's, a, it's in the lily trotter, lily trotter family, this particular African jacana. And you could say, yes, um, I want to show the bird, so let's crop the bird. But that doesn't tell you it's a lily trotter, other than you can just about make out lilies in the background. It's much more illustrative to say, well, that's really what's going on. It's a lily trotter, and it's in a huge bed of lilies. And so, yes, the bird is there in the centre, but don't forget the context. That tells you what that lily trotter actually does, essentially, day in, day out. Serendipity. Sometimes you plan. Sometimes you say, it would be great to go down to the river because we can look at the trees on the river and we might catch a leopard, or let's go out into the savanna because we might catch a cheetah. My friends and I tend to be of the attitude, let's not go searching for anything. Let's just drive and see what happens. And we are great believers in serendipity. If you expect to see nothing, you're not going to be disappointed. There's lots out there. And sometimes you can just get the just amazing good luck. So friends and I, here's, here's the friends and I at a particular lodge. One option is not to bother going on game drives. One option is just to stay in the lodge overlooking a watering hole. This is the watering hole where I took a picture of the eland at sunrise a little while ago. One option is just to stay here, drink coffee and all a beverage of your choice all day and just watch the animals coming and going, whether it be lions or elephant or zebra or giraffe or whatever. So you can see uh, we've got uh, cameras and video and binoculars set up. Sitting there with a bird book and a pair of binoculars and maybe a camera is just a wonderful way of spending a few hours. You don't have to go out on game drives to look at animals if you don't want to. You can just sit and let them come to you. But if you do go on game drives, you're likely to find some wonderful things. So anybody know why this bird's head has exploded? It hasn't, of course. It's a raptor, and like most raptors, it can turn its head through 180 degrees. When it's, looking, when it's looking in our direction, perfectly normal. When it turns its head 180 degrees, like an owl, for instance, the feathers don't lie straight, so the feathers all come up, and so you get that rather weird and wonderful expression on the left-hand side. But it's not often that we actually get that. Again, raptors don't care about us. The raptors don't look at us. We're not something that they can go and feed on, so they're not fussed about whether or not there's a tourist uh, at all close to them. They're only interested about where the next meal is coming from. In terms of Geronooks, uh, they spend most of their time grazing, but every once in a while they get on their hind legs because they want to get at the, the juicy uh, foliage that's a little bit higher than they can reach just by being on all fours. So every once in a while they'll get up on their hind legs, and if you're lucky enough, you can just catch it when that happens. That was indeed a stroke of luck. I was intending to photograph this crowned crane here. I noticed the crane was sitting on the top of a tree. Um, I can't remember exactly how far away it was, probably about 50 meters or so away. That crowned crane made a nice picture with the tree. So I got lined up, and I thought, that's uh, interesting. I took a picture of this particular crane. And then through my other eye, one eye through the 300 millimeter lens, my left eye was also open, and I noticed something going on down here, and I noticed a second crane, presumably the mate of this one, was coming up from behind, and it decided to land on the same tree. And as the bird comes to land, out go the air brakes, it slows down, and then lands on the tree. So catching it at just the point where it was legs down on the branches and air brakes full on with the wings, to land just next door to its mate. The fact that it happened to be such that the two didn't overlap each other was just a pure fluke as to the angle that I was at relative to the bird coming in. If I had passed this particular scene one minute later or one minute earlier, 
I would not have caught that particular photograph. So there's definitely just pure chance in a lot of wildlife photography. We stumbled across a lot of lions. It's almost impossible not to find lions in Kenya. And so in this particular case, there were a couple of young brothers fighting each other. So I took a, a, a video, but this is only for still photography here. So I just took a few, a montage of some of the images to remind us what lions do a lot of the time. They don't spend that much time hunting because once they've had a kill, that will be good for a few days perhaps. So they spend a lot of time just playing and sleeping. In this particular case, mum is feeding youngsters, so that's breakfast for them. In this particular case, uh, again, uh, I think mother rolled over and the cubs tried to go with her and then fell off. It was, a, it was wonderful just to sit and watch that for a while. I've always wondered, I've always wondered about the fate of that little fly there. <laughs> I think it's going from right to left, so did it actually survive this particular encounter with a rather large animal? But again, that's lions doing what lions tend to do, sleep. During the day, they don't do much, and therefore, it's easy to photograph them. Okay, it's not very interesting photographs because you end up with a lion asleep, but at least they're easy to get to. As long as you don't disturb them, they're quite happily going to sleep while you get close to them and photograph them, if you so wish. And of course, there's always youngsters, and there's always the ah factor of seeing young cubs, in this case, a young addition to the lion pride, and we also caught a cheetah, uh, with uh, a number of cubs. This is one that's um, chasing uh, the others. And they are adorably cute when you get close to them, these particular youngsters, the, uh, the big cats. A friend of mine, whilst we were out on the Masai Mara, said, what's that in the tree? And we said, what, what tree? There's lots of trees out there. That tree, is that a kill? Is that, is that an antelope that a lion happened to have, or a leopard has left in the tree there? So we thought, not too sure, let's go a little closer. Oh, no, it's not a, it's actually, a, yeah, okay. It's just a lion having a snooze and you get shade wherever you can. Sometimes they take shade under a tree, sometimes they take shade in a tree. That one, I think, has got a fairly fat belly, so I think that one has fed and is going to probably be there for the rest of the day. But it's a reminder that you just need to be on the lookout because sometimes you just happen on things that you weren't expecting. We approached a lake where we were expecting to find quite a few flamingos. Turns out there were no flamingos there, but there were thousands of pelicans. And once, they, once we approached them, I don't think we spooked them, but as we approached them, a number of them decided to take off. And so for quite a few minutes, we were treated to the spectacle of just a thousand pelicans just wheeling overhead before they decided to fly off, perhaps to another lake not too far away. When you remember how big a pelican is, it looks like these are almost seagull size, but remember these are pelicans, these are huge birds, and the sight of so many pelicans in the sky at the same time was, was really quite incredible. I'm sorry about the pun, had to get it in eventually, didn't I? This is a zebra crossing. Um, th this area, a number of visits to this particular area in Amboseli National Park, was completely dry. But one year, we happened to visit. My friends and I went back uh, expecting it all to be dry, and we found a lake had popped up from nowhere. Not because there had been a lot of rain. The ecosystem is a little bit unusual because virtually all of the water for Amboseli National Park doesn't come from rainfall from above. It comes from meltwater from Kilimanjaro. The ice melts, and it comes underground and effectively bubbles up. So this, this lake effectively came out of nowhere, and after a few days, it simply filled up. You can see it's not particularly deep. It's only sort of shin high to a zebra, as it were, to use the old expression. Um, and in this particular case, zebras wanted to get from A to B, and they always took a particular route. Animals are very much uh, animals of nature in terms of their, their, their sort of their habits, as it were. And in this particular case, the zebras used to be over there, and they wanted to be over here. And the fact that there was now a lake in their way, they didn't figure out, let's go round the lake. No. They just figured, we'll take the same path we always take from A to B. The fact that it's through a lake now is neither here nor there. So again, uh, just standing at this particular point, watching these zebras go by, obviously quite a few flamingos in the background. 
and then this slosh, slosh, slosh noise of hundreds of zebras going by as they crossed the lake from one side to the other rather than go the long way round, which would have taken them an extra 10 or 15 minutes or so. But again, we weren't expecting that, and it produced one of the nicest images that I remember from that particular safari. Nothing much to show here other than if you see enough elephants every once in a while, you get a nice touch, in this case, between an elephant mother and the, the youngster there. Looks like clamoring for attention. Anybody with a two-year-old will know what it feels like to have a, a youngster continually saying, mum, 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 uh, trying to get her attention while she's trying to feed. And in terms of getting close, well, there's really not a problem. As long as you don't spook the animals, as long as you don't make noise, as long as you don't wear really loud colours, as long as you don't wear aftershave that's just too pungent, you can actually get close to animals. This, again, was not too far away. This is, uh, this is clearly a, a vegetarian eating grass, and so it might be the victim of a, of a big cat if there was one in the neighbourhood, but it wasn't particularly spooked by the fact that there were um, tourists around trying to take pictures of it. And so, as long as you're respectful of the animals, you can get close enough to get some really nice images of them. Exactly how many meters can you get? Well, that depends on exactly where the animal is in the food chain. If you're talking about the top of the food ch chain, they don't care a damn about you. In this particular case, an African fish eagle. Um, and this is a reminder that although you can get some nice uh, images of a, tr uh, an, a bird, even if it's in the top of a tree some distance away, with the wonders of digital photography compared to the um, somewhat lower resolution that you might be able to achieve with photographic film in years gone by, if you take um, an image and decide that you want to crop it differently, there's no reason why you don't take a, a smaller crop of one of those digital images and produce some nice close-ups without a zoom lens. This is we're taken with the same lens, literally just cropping that previous image to show a little more detail. And this particular cheetah, again, uh, in the Maasai Mara, there was no problem because it, it had food on its mind, so it wasn't at all interested in the tourists who were uh, 10, 20, 30 meters away. It was fixated on where the next meal was coming from. It might have had cubs somewhere. It wanted to know, are those um, gazelles or Thompsons over there possibly going to be our next lunch? And they were fixated on that, not caring about us. And hence, you can get reasonably close as long as you don't interrupt them, as long as you don't disturb them. This is the same lion that I showed on the splash screen, the one on the log that just happened to look to her left to show us she was in charge. This is her coming out of the bush, again, staring us in the eye this time, as if, what are we doing? Because she is worried because she's got cubs. And whenever you've got a mother and cubs, you do have to worry about the fact that although you mean the cubs no harm, she doesn't know that. And therefore, there's always the danger you never get anywhere close to being a mother and her cubs. And in this particular case, she was effectively staring us down to make sure that uh, we knew that she was in charge of this particular situation. But in terms of how close you can get, well, I have slept in a tent where I was told, don't come out at night. And I thought, ha, what's the problem with coming out at night? The next morning, I found a lion print outside my tent. And then I realized that, yes, they're probably not kidding. Lions and other animals do come through a tented camp, and you do stay under canvas, and you do stay with it zipped up. If, for any reason, you have to leave the tent, there's usually toilets within the tent, so you don't have to, but if you do have to leave the tent, they say, make sure you um, shine your torch, and somebody will come and guide you if you have to go from A to B at any time after the sun has set, after sort of seven o'clock or so in the evening. I thought they were over-egging the situation, but when I saw this footprint, which was just on this pathway, that was my tent, and this is the pathway that we would take between the tents or from the tent to the restaurant, for instance. When I saw that footprint, I realized that they were serious. So either that or the people that supported this particular tented camp had this fake footprint that they went round and and put outside the tents of various people to convince them they were in a dangerous area. That was Governor's Camp, where the BBC filmed Big Cat Diaries, so we know there were lions in the neighbourhood. 
So, whew, had enough yet? Yeah, yawns at the back, I can see, yeah. So baboon yawns and cheetah yawns and hippo yawns. Animals have got nothing to do, so they're always yawning. And every once in a while, you just get it right. Again, complete serendipity. This lion, uh, <laughs> lion, this leopard was in the tree. I was photographing it, think it's not doing much. It decided to yawn, and then I got a picture of its tonsils, basically. Just happened to be lined up nicely. But there's nothing you can do. Um, you can't make them yawn, and you can't put them in position, and it's very difficult to position yourself knowing where you need to be to get the ideal shot. And some, some animals have difficulty yawning. This particular lion... It's only got one tooth. Oh, oh uh, no, hang on a minute. It's got two teeth. It actually had a scar because of a fight, presumably. It had a scar on its jawline, which made it difficult to yawn. So it had to yawn lopsided before it actually got the yawn all the way out, as it were. So it was fine. It could still kill animals with fangs like that, but uh, its, its yawning was a little bit uh, t something to be desired. And let me finish just with a few points. Um, this is a talk about wildlife photography, but if you're going somewhere exotic, if you're going somewhere nice like East Africa, or even if you're going into your back garden, don't forget the, not only the context of the animals, but don't forget the views. Sometimes just taking a picture of the spectacular storm clouds or the crepuscular rays coming out of this particular cloud system on the Masai Mara can be spectacular. In the early morning, getting the light hitting the seed heads of, of nothing in particular other than a view of some grassland can be quite spectacular. And sometimes it's, it's lovely just to park up nowhere in particular, even if there's no animals visible at any time, just park up, admire the view, wait there half an hour, you're quite possibly going to find some animals coming along. But just photographing the views sometimes makes up for if you didn't happen to catch an animal of, uh, of any note in the last hour or so. Occasionally, Kilimanjaro does show itself a little more clearly than the picture I showed, which was a, an earlier one from many years ago. And so this is the most recent safari where I happened to catch it at a time where it was reasonably crisp and the ice glaciers on top of the Kalimanjaro are actually showing up quite nicely. If you zoom in, you can actually see these huge ice cliffs up on the top there. So that's what it usually looks like. It's usually sticking up above the clouds, but every once in a while, of course, it's just completely um, dressed in clouds, as you might have seen from those people who try and climb Kilimanjaro. Not something I've ever had an ambition to do, particularly. I'd much rather photograph it from here rather than go to the top and photograph the other way around. And there's plenty of sunsets, of course. Um, given that it's often clear, it's not always clear, um, you know, the, uh, the Masai Mara has rain clouds, it has storms, most likely uh, like any other place, but a lot of days are clear, so you can often get clear skies at sunrise and sunset, and even if there are a few clouds around, you still get uh, wonderful photo opportunities. And there's the classic picture of Africa, an acacia tree with a sunset. I still have yet to catch a classic sunset with an acacia tree and a giraffe. That's what I want. Acacia tree on one side, giraffe on the other, sunset in the middle. I'll keep going back to Africa until I can catch that particular trio, as it were. And it doesn't always work, as I'm sure any photographer knows. Um, if I've shown you a few dozen images here, I'm sure you realize I've taken far more than that and not all of them worked as well. Um, there's a bird. <clears throat> well, actually, it should be a bird, um, but I wasn't quite quick enough. Some of these weaver birds who build these wonderful structures, they start with a ring and eventually build up to a nest like that. Weaver birds are quite small, and it only takes them about a tenth of a second to fly when they decide to fly and I'm getting old, and my f trigger finger isn't quite fast enough anymore. So there are times when there's a bird on a branch, and I thought that would make a wonderful picture, decide to hit the shutter button, and the bird is gone by the time the mirror has returned back up again. So I've actually got quite a large collection of branch photos <laughs> that used to have birds on them, but don't anymore, and that's just life. If I can catch a bird occasionally, then that's great, but there's still quite a few pictures that end up looking like that. And I have a lot of bum shots as well. Um, 
you usually try and catch animals and you usually want to catch their faces. In this particular case, mother and foal were walking towards us and I thought that will make a good picture. Reached down to grab my camera, which was on the seat next to me. By the time I'd brought it to bear, one or two seconds later, they decided they weren't that interested in us and had turned around and were walking away. So just like I've got quite a few shots of yawns, I've also got quite a few shots of bums, if you want to see the bum collection at some other time. And not only is it too slow in terms of me being too slow, sometimes the shutter speed is too slow. If you wait until after sunset, when the, the light really is dropping, then uh, your shutter speed might go to a tenth of a second or longer. And although I thought that was interesting at the time, it clearly didn't work too well. I, I don't know if it was a bird or a handkerchief or... I assume it was a bird. I think it's a bird flapping its wings, and in a tenth of a second, it's just flapped its wings and moved distance such that the whole thing is just thoroughly blurred, and not only was I not quick enough, but the shutter speed wasn't fast enough to actually catch whatever that object was, whatever that particular bird was. It's so blurred, I can't even recognize it anymore. And yes, I've got quite a few of those as well. So I've got a number of shots that I really, really like, and I've got a larger number of not quite in focus, not quite right, not quite exposed, not quite framed, not quite the right thing that I was intending. But as long as you get a few at the end of the day, you can come away from a safari thinking that was a great safari. So finally, uh, what I've been talking about is framing the subject and getting it in focus and using natural light to best advantage and, where possible, choosing shutter speed and aperture to optimize the image that you're trying to collect. And if you're taking pictures of animals, never forget the background. And there's nothing you can do about serendipity other than give time to allow it to happen. Don't rush. Allow things to happen and then you'll be rewarded. But all of those things might apply to East Africa but they also apply to your back garden as well. That's a picture of our family cat. Uh, I took that when I was a teenager. So that picture is not quite 50 years old now. 40, 47 years ago, that picture was taken of our, of our family cat. It's in black and white, not because it's artistic. It's in black and white because I couldn't afford color when I was a kid. So it's in black and white, and that's our house cat, taken in our back garden. But all the rules still apply. Don't take it in the middle of the day. Try and get the lighting more interesting. In this case, the lighting on the right-hand side of the cat. And obviously, try and make sure it's in focus. In this case, again, on the whiskers. You see, I always go for the whiskers to try and make sure that uh, she's in focus there. And all the rules I've been talking about, not the rules, all the guidelines I've been talking about apply, whether you're talking about a small cat in your back garden or a big cat in Africa. Thank you all very much.